Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Bennett. Each episode, we talk about the research and practical aspects of the trauma informed movement. This podcast is not designed to replace mental health services. If you feel uncomfortable or triggered by our discussion, please consider seeking your own trauma treatment. In no way is seeking treatment an admission of weakness, it is a chance to build resiliency and experience post traumatic growth. You can find show notes, resources, and more at Trauma Informed. Welcome, friends, to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm Matt Bennett, and I'm here with my good friend, Shelly. Uh, Shelly, I had this realization. I saw you in the news here locally, and mm-hmm. I realized that somehow being such a dear friend of mine, being an inspiration to me, and I would say even a mentor in many ways in, in the, the field oh. of homelessness. I okay. haven't had you on the show yet. Uh, I think we have all these great conversations and usually immediately I have folks on the show and maybe I was doing that a little bit because I knew you were in a, a position where maybe you couldn't share as freely. <laughs> now you're out there sharing freely. So I am so excited, my friend, uh, to have you. Uh, I, I can't wait to, to have a conversation about uh, something I'm going to call it theory of mind. I'll define that a little bit more, especially how it uh, uh, applies to, to trauma, which often leads to mental health issues behind your expertise with uh, homelessness, housing, all those issues. And we'll end with some of the great work that you're doing. But uh, for the listener who doesn't know you, my friend, uh, please, please give us an introduction of, of who you are and a little bit about the work uh, that you've done. Okay, thanks, Matt. And I'm really excited to be here. So um, I can't believe you consider me of any sort of mentor. Um, <laughs> so, <it>. my, <laughs> so my name is Shelly Cohen McKittrick. Um, and I am currently uh, working with as a contract support person to the Colorado Col- uh, Village Collaborative and getting ready to launch an organization that uh, called Solid Earth Communities that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I have been working in the with folks um, who are not only traditionally but consistently marginalized in our society for the past uh, 25 to 30 years because I'm getting old, but that just <laughs> means I've done it longer and that means I've learned more. Yes, um, there you go. Wisdom, uh, wisdom. Wisdom. And I'm trying to, I think I'm at this point in my life where I'm trying to make sure I'm passing anything I've learned on because awesome. uh, I am hopefully getting toward being able to rest a little more. And um, I worked in the HIV epidemic, uh, making sure that people had access to excellent treatment and excellent treatment information and uh, nutrition information and all of that for um, about 15 years. And now I've been working in uh, homelessness. They both start with H. So I know, I know. Uh, for what I don't know, five years or so. I I did the the switch and bring bring the knowledge from this other you know siloed community over to this, and then they in, they are very crossover Absolutely. in so many ways. So. Absolutely, great. Uh, you know, it, it, so you've only been working in homelessness for five years. Well, wait a minute. I no, that's not right. I uh, yeah, because I don't do math well. Um, <laughs> I, I'm uh, not saying I'm not saying anything bad about that, yeah. but I 2012, eight years. So okay, I, just, I was like, I, I, I think, think I think yeah, I've yeah, known I, you working in that for a while I longer than met five. you about seven years ago. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, how time flies. Uh, yes. So actually, when I was working in HIV, you know, I felt like um, uh, treatment had gotten to a point where it was so good that if you had access to healthcare, there was no longer an issue. Right. And um, and I know this, you know, personally because my husband is living with HIV, and we've yeah. been together forever. And and you know, old age is going to get him. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> So um, I really wanted to um, move and dive into more a uh, little lower on the or deeper in the core issue, core social yeah. issue layer of, of uh, anti-oppression and anti-poverty and anti-racist work. And homelessness sort of became my next place to apply 
love, compassion, and intelligence and best practices. And, and we were so fortunate here in the Denver metro area uh, that, that you chose us, uh, uh, you know, to, to come and provide that expertise. I know not your first stop in the metro area by any stretch, but uh, uh, just, uh, you know, to be a part of the work that you were doing here. Uh, we're just so lucky to have you. So, uh, you know, it's so hard to measure lives saved and changed in our work because we're not doing CPR on folks. We're not doing surgery. Uh, but, but I know that the impact you have is so far reaching. So it, it is, it's well overdue for us to have this conversation. And thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah. And, and what, what I, again, just uh, waking up and realize I hadn't had you on the show was one part, but there, there was a specific, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing that happened in our community. And, and it, it's something that I don't know we've ever talked about on the show. I know I mentioned it because it, it really informs my thinking. Um, and one of the terminologies you will use to hear it is called theory of the mind. Um, and I think uh, we're going to use homelessness as sort of the way to structure our, our conversation uh, about this topic. But I think when you look at a lot of the, what I like to call the symptoms of trauma, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's addiction, whether it might be uh, unemployment, uh, a range of mental health issues, uh, there's a lot of judgment on those things, incarceration. And obviously uh, we, we know having been in this field and being trauma nerds ourselves, is, <laughs> You know, try, try to find someone utilizing a, a, a homeless shelter in your community who hasn't come from a history of trauma. You could probably, again, the exceptions to the rule always exist, but you might spend a while searching for that that individual. So, so there is this judgment, and, and theory of the mind gave me a way to to understand why, especially a lot of our policymakers, but I would also say our community members, um, our policymakers are just sometimes making the policies that you and I know uh, can either make the, the, the problem better or make the problem uh, worse, yeah. is theory of mind talks about our natural psychological tendency to walk up by someone experiencing homelessness on the street and say, what do they need? But our answer to that question is, what would I need if I was in that position? And, you know, I just, that really helped me appreciate that my thinking about issues, and I always challenge myself to find different issues, and I watch the news and people I disagree with, you know, sometimes I can find empathy there, but it's like, okay, but with the, the person experiencing homelessness, before I kind of got in this field is, okay, well, I get off my butt, I would go to the library, I'd print off my, I don't know, 20 page CV that I've literally <laughs> created over the years, I take that down to wherever I had a job opening because I also have searched for jobs online. I have a LinkedIn account. I put that in. I go to Starbucks because I know they have health insurance, you know, deliver my. And so I was thinking of, you know, it's really easy to say, Matt, get off your butt and go get a job. Now, when I started to learn about trauma, I realized, well, there's a biology and neurobiology, which is expert at surviving there out on the street. Whereas if you put me in that position, that'd be a big T uh, traumatic event for me because I have no skills uh, to survive out on the street. It would be overwhelming immediately uh, yeah. to me. A history of struggles uh, for a lot of folks academically and occupationally. In other words, there's not a 20 page uh, CV necessarily to, to go print out, nor the confidence that I could walk in and get much less maintain employment. And okay. so one of the biggest issues and why I just try to talk to trauma about every single person that, that will listen um, is that the lack of understanding about who is sitting there on, on the street or in the shelter um, is a huge barrier to really addressing a lot of these issues, whether it is addiction. Um, I, I saw, I mean, the crack epidemic was much earlier on in my career, but but we just, we, we didn't, I mean, you, it just, how we treat that was just racist and horrible. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't I also think we understood some of the problems too. Right. So sure. this brings me to you, my friend, <laughs> and, and uh, an event where, you, you know, I, I saw, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, came across my Twitter feed. It's like, yes, because uh, I've been <laughs> commenting about this situation and I'm just so glad you got in 
more of the mainstream press instead of my just my Twitter feed uh, uh, <laughs> with this. And so I, I would love for you to share a little bit um, as you feel comfortable too, but, uh, but I know you've taken a, a really uh, strong public stand on this about kind of how you've seen this impact uh, the work and uh, uh, may, maybe a specific scenario that we're dealing with here in the Denver metro area. Sure, sure. This is a, so what I didn't mention in introducing myself is that the last four years I've, I was the homelessness program director at the city of Aurora and I was the first person to hold that position and um, you know. Can, can I just for, for those that don't know the Denver metro area yeah. I think Aurora is bigger than St. Paul, Minnesota. It's Denver itself is pretty small. Aurora is just this huge. It's a sprawling yes. um, suburb with its own very urban issues um, yeah. that are all its own as yes. well. Um, yeah, and uh, our continuum of care for people that work in homelessness is a really large five county yeah. sprawling yeah. area. Um, so I was in one of those large areas and actually worked for local government, which was, you know, a, a new experience for me and a stretch. And I learned a lot. And in the first few years, like almost any job that you get to create, there was a really awesome opportunity to yeah. go crazy. And, um, and uh, I had marijuana funds to spend, which I think is the best practice as, as a uh, weed becomes decriminalized nationally, I hope, so that it actually stops um, criminalizing folks um, and allows for the funding sources yeah. to be available because millions and millions of dollars come into Colorado as a result of legal marijuana. And uh, a lot of good is being done with that. So um, I think the, the issue that Matt is uh, alluding to here is uh, street homelessness and the way we uh, continue to both um, raise the visibility and uh, of those folks as well as as um, rendering those folks invisible. It is yeah. the most odd dichotomy. Right. Um, you know, you're usually you're you know you're either invisible and and trying to hide out or be in a you know whether it's a closet of one kind or another, immigration, LGBTQ, um, poverty, you know, you can't hide when you no longer have a house. And yet no one wants to see you. So it's this really strange combination of things to experience. And before I came back to Colorado, I was in Santa Cruz, California. And in Santa Cruz, um, unsheltered homelessness is more like 70% or in California in general, 70% yeah. of the population is unsheltered. And here it's flipped. It's more like a third of the population is unsheltered, um, which is good since we get very cold, but still. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Denver has been handling uh, street homelessness where people are in tents and on benches and such in um, their way, which I don't, um, agree with uh, and then hardly anyone in, that works within the homeless uh, services arena would agree that moving people every two to three weeks is no way to help them get on their road to housing or anything that would uh, create a fulfilling life for them. So, um, so there's living on the streets, there's getting told you have to move, there's all your really good stuff that you can't carry within the time frame that they told you that you had to move that gets thrown in a dumpster, you have to go find all your equipment again, you maybe lost your meds in that, you, may, you know, the, the stuff that happens during a sweep is unbelievable. And then um, out in Aurora, we had a, uh, we didn't have a camping ban which was part of the reason I went to work there is that I felt good about that. But, but we still move people, you know, you still, you know. So what happened was um, Mayor Kaufman, who is the, Mike Kaufman, who used to be a, a Congressman in, uh, in DC for Colorado, he's now the mayor of Aurora, um, decided to go underground and be homeless Mike. And he's a, a veteran of the, um, uh, Marines and, uh, you know, a long time uh, veteran of Congress. He was very supportive of VA homelessness issues when he was in Congress. He seemed to be good, that he was going to be pretty mellow about carrying on the homelessness stuff when he got there. But in fact, he went underground and decided to pretend to be homeless for a week 
I think, I think it was, it was a week. week, week, 10 days, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it went 10 days. Um, yeah. <laughs> that those three extra days that can make it really hard. Yeah. Um, but in any case, he, he decided to uh, dress up as a homeless vet and at least, and, and go be disingenuous with people on the streets, yeah. which a is absolutely not okay. You know, in my book, um, secondly, he decided to not, not open up his lens and, and broaden his, his worldview of how humans experience trauma and realize that when he's faking who he is and asking, you know, why people are there, they're going to give him the, oh, you know, hey, I don't like the shelters because I can't drink. True. True that. Yeah. If, yeah. if, if alcohol is your, your medicine or if, you know, whatever your, your, uh, uh, a person's um, self-medication of of availability. I won't even say choice of access of yeah. um, is un, is not allowed where you go to sleep safely, and you become addicted to that substance to yeah. manage your days. Then you're not going to go to that shelter. Exactly. So you'd rather be outside, sleep in a tent. There you go. One answer yeah. for for them. Um, anyways, he came out of that week not understanding anything, in my opinion, right. and and he actually uh, did more damage than any good in in making people be um, seem more stigmatized or or stigmatizing them more. He's got you know a certain amount of of uh, clout in in communities that voted for him, yeah. and. And um, he's going to say these things that we I worked for in Aurora for four years trying to yeah. undo these stigmas and stereotypes. And he went and just kind of threw them all back together at once and said that people are lazy. They like it on the street in a tent when it's 10 degrees out or zero or whatever. They don't want to go anywhere. They don't really want help. People bring them food. How could we possibly just bring them food? Because who needs food? Yeah. It's a, you know, so my, I, just talking about this, my anger gets riled up. And then, and then when we start to, talk, and that's why I got so animated on the press conference because <laughs> I'm feeling the people. Um, so, you know, and then you add to that, that the very people, why the mayor of Aurora decided to go to Denver to hang out with street homeless folks instead of going to our encampments that are more right. like out in fields or in a, 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 a lot that hasn't been developed yet or you know we have a little bit uh, of, of tent homelessness that's cropped up over this last year more than ever like yeah. in our urban areas there's always you know, folks sleeping on the street or in the parks but actual tents haven't been around too much and um all that Mayor Kaufman managed to accomplish was to further stigmatize folks and probably change some of the policy that we've been working so hard to um, achieve and that many of the members of Aurora City Council are working on. So, yeah. um, so you know, what's interesting is that this all kind of came, uh, came down uh, shortly after I'd left the city and, um, you know, trauma was a part of the reason I left. It, it became, it started to become traumatizing for me to have to go to work and fight for people yeah. in, and for every little ounce of policy. And um, I was losing my effectiveness. So I think, you know, the shifts that we see in, in administrations and such like we're watching right now in our country, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, they affect people's lives and you know, right down to whether you're gonna be able to stay in your tent. Yeah. So, you know, the, the other uh, piece of kismet here is that I wound up my first gig outside of the city was to work with the Colorado Village Collaborative. The people here in Colorado who are doing safe outdoor spaces in tiny home villages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I've been able to see even more than ever before because it's, uh, I ran low barrier shelters and lowered the barriers as much as possible, but there's nothing quite like offering somebody a tiny home right. with a locking door, community support, social services support, you know, and you don't have to pass any tests to get in. Yeah. Um, uh, you don't have to prove you're a worthy human being to get in because everybody's a worthy human being to this organization. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to I want to explore that a little bit more with you because I I mean the work that you did I mean the the, the Kaufman scenario is just 
a, a frustrating escalation because it became so public. You, you know, because I, I also like one of the things you did and not that Matt's the answer to all these problems, but you know, you, you brought me into Aurora to talk to city council members, uh, you know, to, to talk to the elected officials, to give them that trauma informed lens and, and not that send through a two, three hour trainings and Matt's is going to change the world by any stretch, but, but like, yeah, I, like, I just wanted him to talk. I just, I like, give me 20 minutes of your time, dude, before you go jump to all these conclusions without, without yeah. having the underlying knowledge. And I just, you know, hearing you talk to, it's like, and, and just being your friend, I, I know yeah. the fight that you were fighting. Um, I, you know, there's a part of me that I, I know, I'll, I'll tell, I'll just admit to, I, I could not have done as long as you did. Um, yeah. I, I just know that about myself. Uh, I, I would, it would, yeah, would not. And you had this resiliency, uh, you know, to, to stick with it. But you, you know, as, as you fought these battles, and, and we're in in many ways, and I know I'm not the only one that would uh, say these words, incredibly successful in a, in a sort of odd, not odd community, but but a politically diverse that's probably better language uh the community uh we, we are colorado we we have all the extremes and aurora kind of puts that all into one yeah aurora is it man yeah i know yeah i mean you go to boulder you get one thing colorado spring you know you, you can usually like aurora is just is everything and yeah. how were you know i think my answer because you know if you've got a hammer everything looks like a nail is you know try to train everybody i can to, to provide that, I, I feel like if you understand the person um, mm -hmm. that you pass, yep. you, your empathy and compassion build. Yeah. And and you're doing that. I know you're doing the educational piece of it as well. Uh, maybe yeah. not as formally as I always did, sometimes as formally as I did. But when you sat with policymakers uh, facing this, uh, yeah. you know, theory of mind uh, sort of mentality, uh, even though I know you hit some frustrating walls, probably yeah. on a daily basis, if not multiple times a day, how were you able to have the success that, that you did um, with, with folks who, who came in with none of that understanding? Right. Well, I think, um, I think you alluded to uh, my opening uh, show in Aurora was, was Matt Bennett. <laughs> and, uh, and we created a, a, a symposium called Creating Healing Communities. Yeah. Uh, um, and addressing homelessness. And, you know, I think one of the things that was successful is we had police and code enforcement and uh, social services providers and um, county human services people, you know, people that, you know, don't necessarily greet people with the most trauma-informed lens all come together. Yeah, banks and, and businesses there too, yeah, which was great. Yeah, businesses, yeah. thank you, business district. And with the only message that I wanted to, them to hear that day is that trauma causes homelessness and homelessness is traumatizing. Yeah. Which yeah. has become sort of my tagline that I got from EJ e. Becker. And, uh, and that point got through and I actually, uh, upon leaving, and I'm gonna tell you a, a story that I shared over and over with people to try and get them to break through their um, box that they put homeless people in, uh, or people experiencing homelessness. I don't know why I get on like talks and then I go I crazy with my language when I'm, I, I regress, uh, yeah, two decades of my language yeah. when I'm on a zoom too. Yeah. 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 But you know, um, well, let me just cut to that. So one of the things that happened at kind of accidentally and organically as I was sitting with one of our neighborhood groups, I'd been asked to come talk. It happens to be the neighborhood I live in, which <laughs> was what, and, and the chair of that meeting, that neighborhood group was the wife of the former mayor who wouldn't let people say the word homeless mm. when he was the mayor of Aurora. We don't have homelessness in Aurora. You know, this is back a little yeah. while, but um, so I was like, well, how's this going to go? And when I got there, I wound, you know, I had a PowerPoint. I was ready to go. I looked at um, the 10 to 12 people that came with only one under 65 yeah. and decided to put the paper and the, the PowerPoint down completely and just sit on the table and have a chat with them. 
And, and what I did, and I found it to be really successful story, so I did it over and over again, is I said, so you know how you guys all feel about family homelessness and how horrible you feel that, that we have school-age children and younger sleeping in cars, sleeping in uh, shelters, um, you know, couch surfing, not being able to stay in one school, all of those things. And you know how you feel about that? And they're like, oh, you know, really grab them. Maybe talk about what how that trauma is impacting their brain development, not like you, but in that really like, yeah. you know, casual way. And then when I've got them right where I want them feeling compassionate for the kids, which is totally valid, of course. Yes, oh yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I know what I, I say. So, you know, the old guy on the corner that you have to look at every day when you go to work and you just wish he'd disappear. You don't want to see that. He's lazy. He's a bum. He never did anything in his life. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was that kid. Yeah. He was that kid that didn't get the intervention and help he needed then. And honestly, it helped me because I've been so focused on chronically homeless adults in Santa Cruz. We had family services and they were, and they were awesome, but ending chronic homelessness was my, and then uh, the chronically homeless families as well, yeah. was my um, passion and gig there. And um, it really helped me to use that analogy in order for me to be more engaged with family homelessness. So it actually taught I taught myself at the same time yeah. that if we don't provide these interventions now for these kids, they're going to be our next generation. Yeah. And, and one of the things that that led me to was a really robust eviction prevention program. So awesome. before awesome. I came to Aurora, I did not understand the necessity of the prevention side to, yeah. you know, to literally interrupt the, the cycle that leads children to be chronically homeless adults. And so that was my learning, one of my learning um, intersections in my work in Aurora, but it also helped to move people beyond. Yeah. But then when it comes to things like increasing the number of people that are allowed to live together in order to afford housing, you know, Aurora turned it down, even though they have a city council member who's only, the only reason she was housed much of the time as a child was because they could share single parents could share how to survive so you know they yeah. some of our alexids can see this in their colleagues and and hear these stories and still not be able to you know draw themselves into not being afraid of folks who are have been beaten up their whole lives yeah you know? well that that's such a i mean they're like i i can the uh, challenge of trauma-informed whatever lens care school Not like <laughs> yeah well, what what happened to you and like I I challenge myself uh, and I try to find someone that I'm yelling at maybe on the news and I ask that question and you know sometimes it gives me more compassion and patience to listen to what they're saying. Sometimes I just continue to yell at the screen, but I, I try to bring that lens onto most things, at least when I'm regulated uh, uh, in my life. And, you know, you know, and this is a little bit of a sidebar, but it's, it's the people that I feel should know better. And I'll, I'll never, I, I didn't uh, add brain space for the guy's name, but it was a it was a rare Republican senator that came out of Massachusetts um, at one point. Uh, I think he only had one term, and I just remember uh, he was on sixty Minutes. Uh, I, I think it was famous for posing nude at one point. Uh, you know, one of those <laughs> weird things of of course, if you're going to get elected as a Republican conservative, and like he was in a transitional living program coming out of foster care. And I, I'd run those programs. So, I mean, obviously dear to my heart and uh, he was cutting funding for these programs. And they asked him in 60 minutes is like, what, what were you? And it's like, well, we just don't have the money. And I'm like, I, you know, so, so even for me, I'm like, ah, like it, I, I think that that's like, th those are the hardest for me. And, and the, but then I step back and I want to, I'll be very general with this comment, but I, I think it's a pretty safe one for everybody involved is uh, we were talking about a very uh, community-based program um, and that, the, uh, that the, the clients, the participants of this program basically had a, a lot of power in that community. Mm -hmm. And very quickly what we saw was it became very uh, 
one sort of race was being coming dominant. Uh, some of the things that are, are inherent values to us, all of a sudden things, and I always found that they're always a lot stricter on each other than we would be. So, so it's like, even, even in that microcosm, all of a sudden you saw, and, and I think a, a model I totally support of really empowering folks, yes. that there needed to be a, a intervention Check. to some extent and conversations to had. You know, so, so I wonder, do you have any, like, I, yeah. just, yeah, it, I know yeah. you faced that quite a bit and that example is really powerful for me. It was, it's a very powerful example. Um, you know, I think, um, and you can you can correct me by in neurobiologically if I'm wrong. I'm not going to get get all geeky. I was the HIV treatment geek, so I don't have to do that twice. Yeah. My, um, <laughs> don't ask me about the HIV life cycle. Uh, uh, not I won't anymore. push you too hard I, I on the go. neurobiology. <laughs> don't have the brain space. Um, so, anyways, uh, you know, it's fascinating to see people who have lived extremely traumatized lives. Um, oftentimes I think just really dig into whatever isms they might have grown up around or, or, you know, never been exposed to whatever, but we do find um, a lot of homophobia, transphobia, racism in, in within the homeless community, yeah. just like we do everywhere else. And, right. and, and like, I think I might've said on the news conference, but I say all the time, you know, people are addicts everywhere. We just see the people who don't have a house to hide under. Yeah. Um, that uh, did you like that? that yeah, um, I do. I do. <laughs> that the way more drug use is going on inside of homes than outside of homes. Right. And if you were having to sleep in a tent that was going to get kicked or you know uh, disturbed during the night, or you were in a park and a woman alone for the first week of your time without a house yeah. because led domestic violence or any of these other things, are you going to be able to sleep through the night? Are you going to be, you know, you're either going to be hypervigilant, which everybody always is, and maybe start using drugs that help you stay up all night. So it could start with a, you know, a yep. really strong cup of coffee, seriously, coffee to, you know, whatever anybody yep. has next that can allow you to not wind up getting raped or not wind up getting beaten up or yep. robbed. And um, I like to say those words really out loud because it happens to people every right. damn night, yep. Matt. You know, every yep. night people are harmed on the street and every day people are harmed on the street. And um, for anybody to walk by those folks and think that there was a dream, a childhood dream that that's where that person wanted right. to land is they're off their rocker. It makes me want to cry right now. You yeah. know, those folks had dreams. Those kids had dreams that were squashed yeah. or, or, or interrupted. Their parents died. I mean, not all trauma comes from abuse. Right. A lot of trauma comes from life happening and, you know, shit happening and not knowing if you're going to have enough food, which we have a ton of right now going on yeah. in our country yeah. and not knowing where you're going to sleep. And do you have to go to school from a car and all of those things? So they get to be grown ups, and if, or we all get to be grown ups, and we bring, you know, we either bring what we have rebelled against to our adult life and where we've really worked, or we bring, you know, what we grew up with. And I, I'm like the luckiest person on earth that I grew up with these really progressive parents and I never felt the need to rebel against that because why would I? But, um, you know, uh, but a lot of folks don't grow up in that. So yeah. I, I entrenched into my, my upbringing just as much as I see yeah. folks get entrenched into other things. And um, so, yeah, we have racism within uh, and, and, and unconscious bias, mm. you know, I'm not yeah. sure. So what happened, what, what happened in this particular program is that the residents of the program who had come directly from the street had an opportunity to be choosing um, to be very involved, if not in charge of choosing the next residents that would come into this program. Yeah. And that was, you know, really, really meeting people in their power and giving them, you know, the, yeah. the authority to make decisions about their own community. And what wound up happening is that the, the community that uh, they were in became whiter and whiter over yeah. a few wow. years as each person of color left, it would get replaced with yeah. a, a person. And so the um, organization didn't, you know, that wasn't cool. <laughs> and yeah. so um, what they, what they did is look at the system that they had created that was almost fully in control of the client's hands to looking at how they can 
um, do initial screenings and initial interviews so that who they're offering on the platter of choices of diverse, future residents yeah. are already going to create a diverse community. Yeah. And a, a funny story um, is that I, that I heard after you were uh, with me at this place is that um, one of the people interviewed for a, um, a placement in the, in the uh, project it, they didn't have video capabilities yeah. so they were just on the phone. The residents on the committee loved this person. And when she showed up, um, they were shocked because she was black. Yeah. <gasps> you know, it was like they hadn't seen her. So they were like, she's so cool. Would she have been selected had yeah. they had a video camera? Who knows? So there are times when, you know, an organization with a, with a mission and a solid uh, anti-racist um, grounding are going to look at how they can change that system just a little bit so that equity and, and inclusion is is built into the formula yeah. without taking all power away from the current residents. And um, it's, yeah, it's a fascinating thing. It can be really ugly, you know, if you're a Black trans woman getting beat up on outside the shelter you were trying to get a bed in. If yeah. you, um, you know, I, even in Santa Cruz, we had some horrendous racism going on at our shelter. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, it became uh, potentially violent. And so, um, you know, being able to draw those lines, being able to draw the lines on hate speech for folks who haven't been given the boundaries that, you know, we grow up going, well, you can't say that word in public, even if you feel it. Um, sometimes you have to draw lines that just say this isn't this isn't acceptable yeah. and then you have to create programs that keep the most vulnerable safe yeah and and i think um you know drawing boundaries around racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and all those things um obviously there's always lines it, the only line that usually a really low barrier trauma informed organization would have is no violence yeah. like don't hit other people don't strength, yeah. you know, I think threatening is a, threats are a whole different thing that in a Trump, through a trauma informed lens, you need to sit down and say, you know, and, and go through that. Or why, why is that what came up for you? Right. You know, you know, what did that trigger for you? Like your big tallness and your deep voice <laughs> and your story. Um, but, uh, you know, I got punched in the face in New York once with when, when I was going on an outreach tour, just because I must have triggered this little yeah. lady to think I was her old sister or something. <laughs> that out ball. She didn't know who she was hitting. That wasn't a reason to fire a client. That was a reason yeah. to say, maybe your meds need adjusting. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, but it takes, like, and, and that, that's the thing. Like, I'm, I'm fascinated, uh, you, you know, from, from the, and I don't have to even talk about the brain to do this, but one of the things I, Daniel Siegel, uh, as an author, talks about the rigid response and that we become very, the more stress we're under and obviously trauma being a, the most intense form of stress we can and knowing homelessness is is a trauma you, you know is, is that we we become very rigid and so the the flexibility to think about oh you know and, and we probably you know i think sometimes miss the training opportunities is like mm -hmm. hey if we're going to hand over who's in the program are they going to get the same training that our staff would in diversity exactly. And, exactly. and other like you just can't give power without the 101 that we give the new staff kind of walking in who made that decision previously so so that rigidity but then we take that and i'm always fascinated with like you know I, i'm not going to get on this too but i just think it's another example of uh prison gangs like all of a sudden you go to, uh, you know, I, I would argue the least rehab oriented uh, environment you could possibly create if you tried, right. but you go in that environment, all of a sudden, what, how do we divide? We have divide immediately upon the most identifiable difference of a them and us dichotomy. And so when we're in that survival state uh, without insight, support, even training, uh, that, that's kind of that, unfortunately for human beings, that, that default response. Right, right. But here's, I want to kind of bring us back though, using, I think this was a great lead in is my, one of my biggest frustrations um, 
and it doesn't stop me. It actually is a big motivator for me. So when I say frustrating, it's a, it's a barrier that I'm trying to find different ways to crawl, a, climb, right. dig under, is that, that I, I believe um, that, that people that often vote in ways, think in ways, act in ways that uh, make homelessness worse, uh, that take away funding, that, that don't believe these people have, are, have enough value to deserve basic human rights are, are also some of the most faith-based religious folks as well. And, you know, I, I just, I, I, I we, we, we've lost our capacity. I just love, I'm going to make a statement. I'd love to get your, yeah. your thought because you are in the trenches every day. I just, I just go visit the trenches and try to yell <laughs> as loud as I can occasionally. Um, like, Hey, we, we share uh, values. Uh, let, let's just stereotype everybody. Take me as a progressive humanist, whatever that means, and an evangelical conservative Republican Christian, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Don't we, as I say, did you read the New Testament? Like, and we share these values, but yet how, we, we've lost the ability to, to say, hey, how, how do those let's work together. Uh, can, can we take homelessness out of this political divide? Because we're on the same, at least the person you worship has kind of given you a directive, uh, more so maybe powerful than any other directive except love. But if you're going to apply that to everybody. And so I, I kind of wonder like as you, and we can get out of religion and back into politics, but as folks that we know are good people. I, I don't think we would, we, when you get to know them, I got them in my family just because they vote differently than me. doesn't mean they're horrible people. Right. Um, you know, and, and you were successful with it. So, so how did you, and, and I know your success came with a lot of frustration of running up against that wall too, <laughs> but, but, but I do, I, I look at you as incredibly successful and in that you did it for four years was two years longer than I could have done it. How were you able to find those shared values uh, to create motivation, because you revolutionized a system in, in many ways. And so, how are you? How are you successful? What What advice would you give me to to do better at, at running into my walls? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and you know, for me, being um, a uh, uh, an ex an ex Jew religiously, you know, so who's, who don't well, I, I, I was born Catholic, so we, we yeah, can, you know, uh, like, no, nobody needs to worry that we don't beat ourselves up. No, so. recovering <laughs> to very much, you know, had my own internalized stuff around that, that I overcome and yes. really, you know, and uh, it took a long time, but I am an, also an anthropologist, so I should have been able to take that on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so actually um, anth being a cultural anthropologist by training has been really, um, really effective for me. So uh, in, in, those, in those spaces where I don't feel comfortable so, because they're, I'm running up against my very core values and what yeah. I stand for. Um, and for me, a lot of times uh, churchy spaces are, are that for me. They're very uncomfortable and rub against me and it, it doesn't matter what, whether yeah. it's you know, I should say places of worship because, you know, it, I'm not only focused on certain religions when I say I get uncomfortable yeah. um, because I've chose to, to put that aside and live by my values, regardless of whatever happens after we're dead. Yeah. This is how I'm going to behave and it doesn't change because of what I believe mm -hmm. um, in a deity or not, but because yeah. I value human life and all of that stuff. Um, so uh, anthropologists do something called participant observation. So when I can be centered and conscious enough and be in those rooms, I can I can separate a, a little bit from my individual self who doesn't really want to be in a space where religion is the core reason why people are gathered together and become more observant of what's the dynamic that's happening in the room. Mm -hmm. And then what, and, and just emotionally separate a little bit so that I can be an observer and not just a participant. Yeah. And uh, so that's been helpful, but also finding the person in the community that can be, or people, the people in your community that can be that bridge to, 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 for me to walk over. And so I found my, my folks who were very involved in communities of faith and also shared my values to the, to the point where I saw that they were enacting their 
religious values in a true form of serving the poorest and most marginalized among yeah. us. So when you find those folks that are doing, that are walking the talk and not really talking very much at all, yeah. they're just doing, yeah. um, then I allowed those folks to be my ambassadors for me into more uncomfortable spaces. And it really worked. You know, yeah. Brian Arnold was one of those people, is one of those. I just people. talked to our friend the other day, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there, there are, there are a few other people, Sean Sikama, who runs Jesus on the, on Colfax, mm -hmm. who would have known that, yeah. you know, I wound up feeling like their work was some of the best outreach that was being done. Yeah. Because they'll just sit with people and listen and be yeah. with them and love them, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I just kind of motivated them to also get them on the path of housing. Yeah, Like, this is all good. This could yeah. be in love and hold, but just like, let's get them connected to services so right. that they're out of that motel or off of that street. Yeah, And yeah. then it's just, there, it, there's nothing lovelier than working with people that go to work from their heart. Yeah. Right? But, and then, you know, you bring up the voting and I, you know, I think uh, not to necessarily dive into our current, national political situation, but I did see Jason Crow yesterday being interviewed a few times on the news, our representative from Colorado. Yes. Go, yes. Jason! <laughs> Voted for him. Um, really talking so eloquently about trauma yeah. and yeah. as a veteran. And I and I, um, I was like, oh my God, he's going to teach Congress about trauma. He's going to, he's going to show them that, you know, yeah, you know, how trauma works and how they can put that experience into action in their work, right. you know, like he did. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm encouraged that I think trauma is becoming a more consistent yeah. conver uh, conversation in the mainstream world. And I hope that that leads to folks being able to stop themselves on the street and say, why am I judging this person? Like what you said, what yeah. happened? And if Mike Kaufman or if Mayor Hancock, if either of those mayors would go sit on a street bench with somebody and say, tell me about your life. What happened to you? Where yeah. were you born? You right. know, did Mike do any of that? I'll guarantee you he never said, tell me how this happened, what happened to you? Yeah. And all he did is say, why are you here? So you're gonna get a trauma yep. brain telling this person who has disingenuous intentions, in my opinion, um, it, it, it maybe not disingenuous intentions, but at least a, um, a misguided attempt yeah. to understand people completely. Yeah. And never asked, tell me about your childhood, what happened uh, to yeah. you? You know, probably why couldn't he ask those questions? Because he would have wound up outing himself because you can't have a deep conversation and be a fake person. Right. You know, putting on a front. I didn't mean to call him a fake person. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was acting a role at that time. Yeah. It wasn't real, which right. is automatically going to be felt by the people if you get into a deeper conversation. Exactly. So he never got right. to their trauma. No. You know, those same people... Jump, I don't mean exactly the same, but the same areas yeah. downtown jumped at the opportunity to move from their encampment that was getting moved all the time into the safe outdoor space, winter ice tents that have finally been set up. These are solutions. Yeah. Uh, you know, solutions to street homelessness are first to give people the sense of safety so that they can get a good night's sleep. Yeah, absolutely. You know? There's nothing more powerful than when somebody walks up to you and said, that's the best night's sleep I've had in 10 years. Yeah. That yeah. is, um, th and then you go, well, no wonder she lifts her skirt and pees in the street. Right, right. She hasn't slept in 10 years. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, can you imagine? I'm an absolute wild animal if I haven't gotten enough sleep and right. it goes past a week, you know, right. and I don't crash at some point to catch up. Yeah. So, yeah. I can't, I can't get a good night's sleep in a hotel bed. How, how white privileged is that? Right. That's white like, and, and I mean, <laughs> it's my reality. I have troubles and I, I would like really pay someone to fly me somewhere safely and let me sleep in a hotel bed right now. But you right. know, when I traveled a lot, I had trouble, you know, and, and again, so, so I like, from my perspective, it's like, what, what drugs would I need to go to sleep? 
outside on on but yeah i already know what my weaknesses are you know yeah, like um, I, by the I time just... you hit 61 you can kind of figure out what where you might go um and um and you know the problem is all those things are available like this yeah. um anywhere you are and um you know and then the other issue that at the other end of that, that is a problem is that, you know, traditionally, uh, well, tr historically, we made people then start to fix themselves before they came into our systems right. at all. Right. And, you know, so luckily, most of that has been thrown away. Yeah. Uh, however, I fear, you know, I fear that we can lose ground at any given moment. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and people are not being asked to change in order to walk through the door, yeah. but you can't change when you're in the situation that's causing you trauma. And I know you talk about that all the time. But, yeah. you know, this is the reality when you don't know if your tent's going to be there when you come back from maybe trying to apply for a job, or yeah. what is going to be gone from your tent or whether or not it got thrown in a dumpster right. by the top, um, you know, you're not going to be able to present yourself at an interview. Easy. Never mind all the technical, very good practical ones of where you can yeah. shower, get cleaned up and all that stuff. Yeah, That stuff is the stuff we're pretty good at providing solutions for. We have day resource centers. We can help you get spiffed up to go get your job. But if you can't work till two in the morning and still be able to go into your shelter bed, because it's after the hours that they allow people to come in and then you'll lose your job because you don't have a place to sleep. Like all of these things are almost impossible to change from the street. Yeah. And when people are from the, the unsupported street, but a safe outdoor space in a heated tent, you know, you don't have to build great big new congregate spaces in order to get people into safety security, a little less hypervigilance, let that cortisol dr drain out a little bit, you know, day yes. after, you know, instead of coming back yeah. every day, the cup is not always full anymore. They can have a little space to, to breathe and, and that, uh, what do you call that space you talk about? And that space opening up. Window of tolerance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, that starts to grow. Um, one of the people at CDC who I adore that I work with, um, Puika Montoya just mentioned that, um, uh, 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 somebody that wasn't a resident at the safe outdoor space, um, got frustrated and hit her. And, um, and she said, it was a triumphant moment for me because I didn't hit back. Yeah. And, you know, she, and it was her first experience of having that window of tolerance yeah. to be able to be the person that, you know, yeah. that set the boundaries and breathe as the leader of the That's awesome. Space. And, um, yeah. Oh, so, awesome, in, awesome in its own neurobiological yeah, way. Totally like, awesome. And I've been hit, you know, but yeah, we've, we've all been hit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that lady couldn't, couldn't access those services anymore yeah. for that reason, but it was all understood in, as a as a moment of of uh, trauma and uh, you know fight instead yeah. of flight. And um, so you know this all leads to the importance of not leaving people to languish on the streets without real opportunities to engage in getting their life back on the track they want to be on. Yeah. And it's you know I've never. I've never heard somebody start to dream that doesn't have an awesome uh, yeah. idea of something they'd like to, even if it's just taking a bath with bubbles, exactly. right? Even if that's the dream is a yeah. bath and a, and a bubble bath. And so, you know, I decided when I left the city, I'm helping a segue because I'm looking at the time. Are you proud of me? Now, let me let me ask you one more question because okay. I do okay. I do want I want I want to give you to talk about okay. the great work that you're okay. doing. Uh, yeah. uh, is I, one of the things that frustrated me about Homeless Mike um, and that thing is, one, everything we've talked about. Um, and, and I went to kind of a dark place here and then I got myself back because I was like, okay, here is a mayor of a large part of a metropolitan area, but, but Aurora is huge if you haven't been out to uh, Denver property. Almost 400,000 people. Yeah, it's, it's a huge metropolitan area. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was like, here is someone let, let's let's give uh, let's be strength based for a second um, that spent a whole week trying to understand homelessness. And we both agree went about it all wrong. Um, right. I, I thought about, though, that like, OK, if Mike would have come to me, one, I would not have himself label himself homeless Mike. Uh, 
but you know, besides that, it's like, because initially I, I was thinking about what kind of cocktail I would want him to shoot, you know, to inject in his bloodstream to understand what addiction was like. That was my first dark place I went. And then I was like, maybe I shouldn't be ejecting our elected officials with my <laughs> made up personal cocktail of trauma. Um, yeah. But, but I, I was like, what would you, because you were in this position and, and I'm almost, not that anybody came to you do this, how would have you constructed that seven days? And you know, I know I'm just throwing the drop oh, this yeah. question at you like without any warning, but I, I would love, you don't have to be like day by day, minute by minute, but what, what would be, because I think sleeping out on the street um, is good. I also like what some of my uh, friends in uh, Fort Collins, north of Denver do. They only let, they let people do the camp out thing, but then they make them go to appointments the next day on the public transportation line, which I think is a, a great addition for empathy. Uh, you know, uh, but again, not the full experience by any stretch, uh -huh. but another real frustration uh, with that. So, so if you were to craft, uh, let's say, let's just call him Mayor Mike instead of yes. homeless Mike, which I, yeah. I, at that point he had lost me uh, before I even read what he did. But yeah. well, how would you craft seven days uh, if, uh, of, of a good experience where maybe an elected official who is maybe voting in ways that makes the problem worse gets yeah. at least a better understanding of uh, of who they're trying to serve and because I think he's trying to help I, I just yeah, think no I think his intentions were good he's yeah. not he's not an evil person or anything no um, and we need to make sure on our side we don't yeah jump to our rigidity and say just stops trying yeah um yeah. you know I would have appreciated it uh if he had come to me when I was still there, because I very likely was still there when he was planning this, yeah. um, or thinking about it, or come to the, you know, anyone else in the homeless services community, the new person they've hired, um, and say, I'm thinking about doing this. I'd appreciate it if you would keep it confidential for now. Yeah. Um, but what would you recommend I do? Uh, this is what I would have said. Yeah. I would have said, don't don't lie about who you are. Yeah. Lying to people isn't cool. Yeah, it's really not cool. I would have said, uh, be as genuine as you can and introduce yourself to folks and say you'd like to be able to hang out with them for a few days in their encampment and hear about their lives and yeah. what led them to being here. And then hang out, sit around the campfire and don't say the cops or the fire department's going to come, you know, like, yeah. And, you know, and do it in the city you're trying to work on that you are yeah. a mayor of, maybe. It really didn't make sense that he did all of this in Denver when we have our own really entrenched chronic homelessness right, right here in Aurora. Colfax Avenue is full of wounded yeah. hope. Yeah, yeah. You know? And um, uh, it's just, you know, so I would have just asked him to be sincere, genuine, honest and shut up and listen yeah which I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure he did listen you know but he listened by asking questions pointed questions yeah you know and lying and, about, about who you why are you yeah and lying about who you are yeah and um, i i mean i i think the thing that, that 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 pops into my head after i created my own traumatizing addiction cocktail i i thought about he should inject it <laughs> himself well once i once i calmed down my own uh, negative response to the situation i was like how powerful and rare would it have been if he spent not even a week but a couple days even a couple hours even listening to folks as the mayor like like you know just just taking a city council member with him or two and, and going and doing just well, i mean i wouldn't call them focus know. groups per se they didn't need to be that but just like going and, and having yeah. the legit one-on-one -on -one conversations legit group conversations yeah. getting yeah, I mean, a little bit of education to ask yeah. understand i would have loved to have had that up front so you know kind of who you're talking to not not yeah. that you want to just judge them prematurely but but here's here's the other dynamics and the complexity of this issue um because that's like a thing is the, these folks as you mentioned in in the intro are so invisible well, what a what potentially a life-changing moment for everybody in the room 
including if you ask me to facilitate, I don't know how I wouldn't cry if that was going on. Like <laughs> I, I, would, I would not be the right person. You'd want to get like a focus group person who wouldn't cry during it. But like, like it just like, it's like you, you never, you never heard, you know, you never really heard and you never understood. And it's like, Oh, just, just give me even a day, even a, even like a, a day to educate and then listen and, and how different that experience could have been. I think it's a little bit like uh, folks who travel and stay at the all inclusive. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not being judgmental because we did that once when we went and it's like, well, this really is easy. We yeah. just kind of didn't have enough money on that trip. It was cheaper to do the all yeah. inclusive and eat yeah. there. But that's kind of like that kind of traveling, which is not my idea of really traveling. Yeah. Um, even on a vacation versus renting a house and, right. and embedding yourself in the community, even if it's for two weeks or, yeah. or a year or six months and really yeah. diving in, you know, so I think the anthropologist in me, the, you know, who is always working in the anti-oppression space, always, yeah. you know, always looking in, uh, looking at things like apartheid in South Africa and, and unequal access to healthcare here and things like that. The anthropologist in me automatically wants to hear people's stories, but I think a lot of us have it. As soon as you open it up, first off, people need to share their stories and get them out, not in that rote, as you said, you know, one intake after another, right. so that the person says, can I swear on this show? Oh, yeah, go for yeah. it. I don't want to have to fill in another fucking intake, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was one of my Wait, way to quote me with your cussing. Yeah. I know. Yes. <laughs> uh, but anyways, you know, to really, truly and genuinely listen. And, yes. you know, we have uh, an interesting thing I, I've observed in the last um, year or two is I used to do the VI spadats in Santa Cruz as a provider quite a bit. And I, VI spadats are the vulnerability index that yeah. help uh, have helped us uh, over the last several years decide who's the most likely, you know, to not survive on the street and need the housing the yeah. most quickly. And um, what's really interesting when people leave this straight off the street, pack their backpack and come into a tiny home at C Colorado Village Collaborative. And then if they don't get um, uh, we turn it into a verb, VI spedatted <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, within the, you know, first month or two of being there, probably, hopefully within the first month, then you're going to see their vulnerability scores just drop. And um, so the reason yeah. I found out was because they were, um, the staff was uh, conducting some initial VI spadats on folks who had been in the tiny home village for a couple of years. And I had met those folks and I expected them from you know, what I had gathered about what kind of level of in housing intervention they needed, that they would fall into the permanent supportive housing category. Yeah. And yet they were scoring on the low end of rapid rehousing. Well, why? Because yeah. the questions are, have you had involvement with the police over the last six months? Have you had to go to the hospital in an ambulance? Have yeah. you, you know, all of these street emergencies that had stopped happening in their yeah. lives. And all of it, so, you know, we want the, the importance of getting those assessments as people, because they're still going to be challenged with their chronic trauma and yeah. length of time out of the workforce and all of those challenges, getting past the felony because you're a black woman and, and, and the white woman in the shelter city next to you didn't get a felony for the same thing you got a felony for. And now you can't get an apartment and, you know, you really want to see me get mad we're going to, we go there another time. Um, and, uh, you know, we need people, people need time to heal, but we also need to accurately assess their level of trauma and, um, and need at their most vulnerable so that when over the long haul, they get the intervention they need in housing Absolutely. and, and they, we can back it off as the healing yeah. happens, you know. Yeah, and uh, there's a return on investment in this. And I know those come from, I mean, the hard things, they come from different pots of money. So they may not show up uh, in the same fiscal year as the investment is made, but there's a freaking return on investment too. All right, let, let, let it, let's wrap up. You're doing some amazing work. Uh, just because you left the city of Aurora doesn't mean you haven't stopped uh, yeah. with our shared passion of ending homelessness. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I know multiple things going on right now, but but tell folks, uh, maybe if you could throw a web address or two, we'll put some sure. information in the show notes, but maybe for just the listeners, uh, some some easy uh, access to you. But uh, t- what, what great work are you doing now? Well, thank you. And, and it, it really is this segue from talking about uh, being on the street or in a tiny home or a shelter, if that works for you, which is great. I love shelters when they work for folks. Um, and how do we get folks into the housing that, it, that they need that is trauma-informed in its, both its design and its application of supportive services. And one of the, you know, we have a lot of need for density, housing density and in our, in our cities, because there's a lot of folks that need housing, but a house, I mean, sorry, a, a, an apartment in a high rise isn't gonna necessarily be the best fit for everyone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, why do we think that we can have one type of housing as a solution for everybody that has experienced housing instability? Yeah. Um, you know, that doesn't even have to be a uh, straight up literal homelessness. And so I am, am working with a group called Solid Earth Communities. Um, previously, they were, uh, um, known as earthen blocks homes, still that still exists, but basically we're going to be building compressed earth homes um, uh, out of dirt and hemp and, you know, <laughs> mud, but then they get compressed and dried in the sun um, and become as solid as any fired brick, but they weren't fired. So there's the carbon emissions of making the houses is much lower. The walls are a, a, a foot thick. So they wind up being soundproof, waterproof, bulletproof, which in some urban communities, just knowing, even yeah. if you're not living there anymore, if you've been in neighborhoods with drive-bys oh, and yeah. to your family members, knowing your home is bulletproof is not a bad thing. Not bad. Um, but in any case, we're going to be building communities, not just the sporadic homes. And so awesome. what we really want to do is build um, casitas that folks who want a single family home with detached walls because they feel more secure in that or because they want a garden or because they want to live in community, they can have that in a way they never would have been able to, to imagine for less than the price of building an apartment because awesome. of this, these construction materials. And then over the long haul, the maintenance of the building is very low because it's earth and it's yeah. not going to go anywhere. And these buildings last for friggin' ever, like hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, the website is really easy. It's solidearthcommunities.org. And my email is Shelly, with an E-Y, at solidearthcommunities.org. Awesome. So, um, you know, I'm really excited about that. Um, I think all of us need to switch up what we do every once in a while. I needed a little space from all the politics and the direct service, although I'm really enjoying being back in that direct service yeah. world a little bit. So I, I just think it's going to be awesome to be a creator of spaces that are trauma-informed in their design, in the material they're constructed of, in the having a front and a back door in case people have this need to have a place to flee yeah. and being able to have a little garden space even if it's only a 350 square foot home awesome. you know it's really exciting to think about creating a home for folks that isn't in a high rise i love the high rises not crazy. we need yeah. them this is a different offering altogether yeah. awesome and i i love uh, someone who's tries to you know eliminate my uh carbon footprint as much as possible i i don't i think often we don't uh take into account the environmental costs of construction. And yes. uh, so, so you, yes. you, you hit me on two fronts there. I know uh, it's so the, awesome. It's like, you, I've had all these conflicts in my work that I've had to be, you know, yeah. with my work here. and now it's like, well, there's not an environmental conflict. It can be trauma informed. I'm really not having a lot of conflict right now. So that's awesome. Nice. <laughs> well, well hey, it's a great place to end up. My friend, I, I just want to thank you as someone who lives in the community, uh, not, not right in Aurora, but like I said, it's the Metro area. I, I want to thanks for all the hope, all the work, which, you know, I, I know was a, uh, like pushing that boulder up the hill, but uh, we are better as a community uh, because uh, you did that amazing work. Uh, and I'm really excited to see where this innovation uh, yes. goes next. And I hope a lot of people are very uh, interested and, and will reach out. Uh, we'll, we'll put the information in the show notes as well as tra- trauma-informed lens. 
www.thepeopleshow.org. So uh, thank you, my friend. I, I, I got to have you back. I, I can't go several years without you coming well, back to the show. About, let's talk about equity and race next time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe who knows when this community is built. Maybe, maybe it'll be the first. I guess we have been uh, uh, on the road with this podcast once or twice, but uh, uh -huh. that, that, that we'll, we'll save that for the future as well. So okay. uh, thank Sounds you good. so much and I'll see everybody uh, next week.